Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've started a series where we're looking at healing from complex trauma. And we've been looking at one of the key ways of healing or understanding the healing process is to look at it at reparenting. So you weren't parented as well as you should have been when you were a child. So part of healing from complex trauma is reparenting. And that includes having other surrogate parents, but also parenting yourself. And last week we looked at the core building blocks of childhood. What a child needs as the building blocks of their life if they are going to become a healthy individual. And we talked about the foundational building block is attachment. And all the research that's happening today that's just affirming that this over and over again, that attachment is the central core building block to a healthy life. So I got thinking about that. I think it was about 15 years ago I taught for the first time on the subject of attachment. And at that point in time, there wasn't a lot of information available about attachment. It was still a fairly young field of research. As I was thinking about doing this talk today, I started looking at what's available on YouTube, on the internet, on books available, and there is tons of information available today on the subject of attachment. Well, that kind of put me into a quandary. What do I talk about since there's so much information out there? And then I also realized that I've done a couple major talks on attachment here at Finding Freedom in the past. I did one during the series on codependency. I did one in the series on relationships and complex trauma. So I didn't want to be just repeating old information. In those talks, I talked about how different types of attachment styles come out of complex trauma, where a child isn't able to attach securely, so they have insecure attachment styles. And then I talked about how lack of attachment shows up in a child's life. The early warning signs that they haven't attached well. And so I don't want to go back over all of that material. And, and I thought that since the focus of this series is on reparenting ourselves in order to heal, I would look at attachment from the perspective of reparenting. And so I want to focus in on Understanding the basic core requirements of healthy attachment, secure attachment, and then the tools that would be useful in healing broken attachment or insecure attachment so that you can begin to form secure attachment in relationships that haven't had that. So that is what we're going to look at today. And I want to focus on four main types of attachment. Attachment with yourself. If you're going to reparent yourself, you have to attach to yourself. That's because complex trauma, we're not just insecure attachment with others, we also don't attach to ourselves. And so the foundational place for healing is connecting with myself. Then I want to look at most of you have children, and most of you want to form healthy attachments with your children so that they don't go through what you went through. So I want to look at tools for building healthy attachment with your children. Then, most of you have not had healthy attachment with friends, family, partners in your life. So I want to look at tools for that. And then for many of you, you're working on forming an attachment with a higher power. And, and what are some of the tools for that? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's just begin with a reminder of a definition of what we're talking about when we talk about attachment. So attachment is the ability to establish an emotional connection to another person. 
So to do that, it requires an environment that enables a child or a person to feel safe and that they can trust. So if you can't, don't feel safe and you don't feel you can trust, then you don't feel you can connect. So attachment is that emotional connection. What is really coming out of the research is that this drive to connect is one of the most powerful drives that we have as human beings. But it, it's, it's a drive that hasn't been properly understood or acknowledged in the past, and we're only now beginning to really understand how important it is and how powerful it is. So the issue around complex trauma is complex trauma is all about not connecting in a healthy way. It is about insecure attachment. It is about a child wanting to connect with their parent, but for whatever reason, they're not able to connect. And so there's lack of connection, which makes a child feel all alone, which creates a, a lack of safety and therefore trauma in a child. So complex trauma is closely connect, connected to this attachment topic. Somebody has said this, given that the infant's primary drive is towards attachment, not safety, they will accommodate to the parenting style they experience. In other words, they will e keep trying to attach even in the midst of danger, but they'll try to attach in a way that doesn't get them hurt. But the problem with that is they end up attaching in ways that aren't healthy, that aren't going to meet the needs that they're looking to have met. And so it is going to result in lack of healthy attachment or insecure attachment. But a child is driven to connect. It even overrides their drive for safety. So let me just take you right back to infancy and, and build some stuff here that I hope will help you. So... For a brand new baby, attachment is all about their needs being met because they are not capable of meeting any of their needs. They are totally dependent. And so they must attach to someone who is able to meet their needs. So that becomes mom and dad primarily. The focus in a brand new baby the focus is their physical needs. They need nourishment. And so that is the main focus of the initial attachment. And so to make that happen or to facilitate it happening, oxytocin is released in the mother so that she is drawn to want to attach to this infant. So initially, attachment is all about getting physical needs met. But it doesn't stay there. Attachment quickly moves to more, to a deeper level. They w need their need, their physical needs met, but they also have other needs. And so attachment moves beyond just getting physical needs met it moves to getting emotional needs met, to wanting a relationship with people. So in order for that to happen, the child must feel safe to connect. So now safety becomes an important consideration. Now keep in mind what makes this challenging is a child is a vibe machine. They are constantly attuned to their caregivers and how their caregivers are doing. So for a child to attach at this deeper level to get emotional needs met, to develop a relationship, they need, are attuned to their parents and they're looking for 
two things, and this is so important to understand. So attachment to the child now depends on who their parent is and what their parent does. Now often the focus today for parents is on what they do. That you do these things to become a good parent. But what attachment research is showing us is that what you do is important, yes, but what is even more important is who you are. That becomes the most important thing to the child who's wanting to attach to you as they attune themselves to you. So let me explain what I mean when I talk about who you are. Number one, Not only is the child attuned to you, but they want a sense if you are attuned to them. Are you aware of their physical state, emotional state on an ongoing basis? Are you tapped in, attuned to that? Are you aware of their struggles, of their needs? Are you aware of their schedule that they need to keep? How much are you attuned to them? How much are you paying attention to them, basically? Secondly, when you are with them, not only are you attuned to them, but are you present to them? Are you available to them? So you're not just physically connected, but you're emotionally present. You're emotionally available to them. That is such a key thing. And what that means to a child is, is your heart open to them? Are you giving them your full, undistracted attention? So a child is sensing that. And that is who you are. Thirdly, they are sensing whether you accept them totally for who they are, with all their limitations, with all their needs, with all their problems. Next, they are sensing, do you love them unconditionally? Do you have feelings of compassion and empathy and warmth to them? Or are you cold to them? Are you close to them? Next, they are looking for consistency on your part. They can attach to you if you are loving one day and angry the next day. They need a consistency of acceptance, of love, of safety, of an open heart to them. And they can sense that. But then it goes further. They are sensing if you are regulating your emotion. Are you managing your impatience or are you letting it show? Are you managing your irritability or are you letting it take over? So how well are you managing your limbic brain? They are alert to that because they cannot connect to you if you are dysregulated emotionally. Then... Is your stress system activated? They are sensing that. Because if your stress system is activated, then you are into your limbic brain, into fight, flight, freeze, into survival mode, and they cannot connect to you if you are in a place where you are overstressed and it is taking over. They need you to be managing your stress well so that it is not activating your stress response system. Then they are sensing how much anger you are carrying all the time. And it might not be explosive anger. It might just be they sense your anger. That's just there. You're all the time. And if you are an angry person, they cannot connect to you. So what they are looking for is, our, is their contentment there. And part of that is, do they accept themselves? Do, do mom and dad accept themselves? Are mom and dad at peace with themselves? Or another way to say that, 
our mom and dad healing from their shame, from their own hurts and wounds. Our mom and dad humble, grateful, at peace. Do they have a joy? Those are people they can connect with. So the child is sensing how healthy mom and dad are. What kind of emotional, mental, spiritual state they are in. So the bottom line is this. The healthier the parent is, the more easily a child can connect with that parent. In other words, what your child needs is for you not just to do certain things, but to be a person who is growing towards meeting your needs, dealing with your issues, dealing with your hurts, becoming healthier, managing your emotions, managing your anger, so that you are becoming a person who is at peace with themselves, who is in a state of contentment. Then the child says, okay, I can attach. I feel safe with this kind of person. So that is huge. And you're not going to get all of that overnight. But I think a child can also sense if you're growing in those areas. And if you're growing, that is helping them feel more comfortable to attach with you. Okay. But it also includes what a person, a parent does. So let me put it this way. Let's say that I am attuned to my children so that I go when they get home from school or I go to visit them today as adults, then I go in and I sense how they're doing emotionally, if they're struggling at all, and I'm present to them. I take time to say, how are you? And I, I connect to make sure there's nothing between us to make sure they're doing okay. And let's say that takes five minutes, ten minutes. And then I go, okay, I'm attuned, I've connected, um, I'll go and watch TV. That is not going to be satisfying to children. That is not going to make them feel love. So yes, I need to be attuned, yes, I need to be present, but if the relationship with my children is to grow to a healthier, deeper, more intimate relationship, more is needed than just being attuned, just being healthy, just being present. I need to do things with my children. So let me give you what children need me to do. Number one, they need me to give them blocks of time of focused attention so that they are the center of my world at that time, for a period of time. They need me to understand them, to take the time to understand their personality, their dreams, how they think, how they tick, their love language, their struggles. To get them, they need that badly. They need me to speak their love language so that they will feel love. Not just to love them in a way that is my love language, but to talk in their language, even though it might be a foreign language to me. They need me to listen, to let them share, and to know there's somebody there not necessarily just going to go and try and fix them or try to get them to get to the point, but is just there to be able to listen, to let them talk about their world. But they need somebody who spends quantity of time as well as quality of time. They need me to do stuff with them, stuff that interests them, to go on a hike, to go swimming, to play house. They need me to enter their world and spend time in their world with them. And they need me to communicate about my world. 
And that's dependent on their age. But as they get older, I can share more about my life, more about my past, more about how I think and what happens in my brain and in my emotions and in my world. And then they just, they just need me to talk about stuff. Not necessarily deep, just to keep the communication lines open. And then they need me to stay connected even when I'm not physically with them. So when I'm away from them, a text during the day on asking how they're doing or a phone call helps them feel connected. So what I want you to see is that takes time and energy, but we can't go to deeper connection unless we do that. So this is work, but it should be enjoyable work. It is investing in a relationship that's going to become a, a friendship, that's going to become a healthy bond, but it takes commitment. It takes time. It takes a commitment to love them consistently. So here's what I want you to see. Do you see that there's a type of attachment also that takes a relationship deeper? And so it's, it's an attachment that progresses over a period of time, and it's an attachment that takes doing things and chunks of time in doing those things. But here's what I want you to see. <clears throat> I can stay attuned to my children 24-7, but I can't do this deeper attachment stuff 24-7. I don't have the time to do that extra stuff. I can give them chunks of time through a day and through a week, but it can't be sustained 24-7. So, those chunks of time... Some of them will happen spontaneously. Some of them will just be, hey, let's go do this. I got a bit of time, let's do this. But most of the time, if I'm going to have this deeper attachment, I can't depend on just spontaneous. Because then it probably won't happen well. I have to plan it. I have to plan schedule time to deepen these connections, to make them stronger and deeper. And so, take that further. When you're talking about attachments with children and this deeper attachment, which requires chunks of time, what I do in those chunks of time is probably going to change because children change. So maybe at two, three, four, five, they want to have a tea party. But over time, they don't want to have tea parties with me as they get older. They want to do different things with me. So I have to be willing to adapt and change in order to maintain the connection with them. And that's important to understand because some are really good at connecting with their children when they're two, three years old, but they're not good at connecting when their child is 10, 11, 12. And so as parents, we have to learn how to maintain the connection with our children as our children change. Okay, now I want to go to very practical tools. So a lady by the name of Diane Poole Heller has written a, a very helpful book called The Power of Attachment. And in this book, she gives what she calls secure attachment skills. SAS. And it's just very practical tools to help build attachment with others, our children, friends, partner, family, even with ourselves. So let me just give you just some practical, practical stuff. So again, it all begins with being attuned. So what can you do? So what can you do to develop attunement skills? One of the things that I do when I first meet with somebody is I want to get a sense of where are they at? What do I sense? What are my vibes telling me about this person? 
So when my wife walks in the door or I go visit my kids, within a minute, I am attuned to how they are. I sense how they are doing. So you have to consciously kind of do that in the beginning. When you're with somebody, just, okay, what, what am I sensing here? So do that. And then I have to make sure that I'm not just kind of attuned to them and interacting with them intellectually. I have to make sure I'm open in my heart. There's an empathy there. There's an emotional openness to this person. And then I want to be aware of their emotions, but also in getting to know them, what makes them tick? I, I don't just want to be attuned to their mood. I want to become attuned to who they are as a person. So then the second thing is, <clears throat> I need to learn skills to listen well. So part of attunement is I have to be able to listen. And the sad reality of our world today is that most of us just aren't good listeners. There's so many distractions happening that we don't listen well. And so we need to train ourselves to become good listeners. So what does that mean? It means that somebody is sharing with me, I give them 100% focus. I give them consciously my full, complete attention. And most of us don't do that very well. So here's some practical things you can do. You can turn and face them. That might help you with that. You can make sure you stop whatever it is you are doing. On your phone, an activity, and you turn and face them without distractions. And then listen. So important, especially with young children, if we're parents. Then the third thing that we can do very practically is what Diane calls joint attention. And that is consciously doing things together. So you schedule a couple times every day just to stop and say, how are you doing? And you find out from each other how you are doing. So there's a joint giving each other attention. And sometimes it might go longer because you might be having a struggle or they might be having a struggle and you need to talk about it a little bit. Then you learn appropriate questions to ask each other so that you can get connected. You can understand where each other is at. And so it's not just how are you doing fine, it's wh what are your emotions today? What have you been thinking about? Anything you've been struggling with today? On a scale of 1 to 10, where's your contentment at today? Where's your anger at today? Those kind of questions. And then you can say, what was the best part of your day, the worst part of your day? What are you thankful for today? So you learn to ask each other questions that help you connect together. And then you have a date, a scheduled time, where you do an activity together. It's a joint operation. You're doing stuff together that you both enjoy, where you get to know each other better, where you get to enjoy each other better, where you get to attend each other's needs with focused attention. And then we're always needing to work at practicing being present. And where I would just encourage you to start is becoming aware of times when you aren't fully present and then figuring out why or what to do about it. And so a lot of people today have great difficulty being present to somebody who comes up to them if they're on their phone or if they're watching TV, or they're playing a video game. So becoming aware of the times you struggle with stopping that and giving a person your full attention. And so you have to 
develop ways when somebody comes up to you needing your attention to put aside those things, to stop them, open your heart to the person and give them your attention, not just mentally, but engaged emotionally. This is so important. If your child comes to you or your partner comes to you and you're distracted and you're half listening and you're kind of mentally there with them but you're not emotionally there, it's sending them a message that they don't matter. It's sending a shame message, a very damaging message. Then develop ways to maintain contact. So for some people... Part of attachment is a physical touch, touching them on the shoulder, on the arm. That becomes important to them to feel connected. That's often very important for a child. For some adults, touch, don't. You can't do that with them. That just sends all the wrong messages, so that's not where you can go. But for some, it is. Another way to maintain maintain contact today is via texting. Just, how are you doing? How's your day going? Giving updates throughout the day. How's, what's happening today? What are you doing? What's on your schedule? How did that meeting go? Just updating each other throughout the day. Now, I want you to understand just what we're finding out scientifically. We are wired neurologically to best connect with people when we can face them face to face, when we can see them, when we can look into their eyes. That has the greatest neurological effect towards feeling connected. So facing a person is so helpful in establishing connection. But, This is where it can get tricky. For some people, creating eye contact is really important for them to feel connected with you. But for others, eye contact, they can't go there. And it could be because it sends the wrong message. It could be that for them, that might have a sexual thing from the past. Or it could be that culturally, to look somebody in the eye is actually a sign of disrespect. So you don't do that. Or they might have grown up in a home where they were told, look at me when I'm talking to you. And and so it's a very much feeling of punishment or shame to, to create eye contact with somebody. So you have to be just alert to whether eye contact is important or not to a person. Another thing that we are finding is that our nervous system is made to co-regulate. So a child learns to regulate their nervous system by connecting to mom's nervous system, by connecting. And then mom's nervous system regulates their nervous system, so they co-regulate. Many people from complex trauma, in order to regulate their own emotional systems today, their nervous systems, they need another person connected to them so that they can co-regulate to that person's nervous system. So for some people, a hug, an extended hug, helps them relax. It helps them to regulate their nervous system. Now again, that's tricky territory. For some, that sends all the wrong messages. For some, they just cannot go there, and that's okay. But for a person who needs that and has a person who can give that without the wrong messages, that can be an important thing. Okay, the sixth thing to to help in this attachment thing is be conscious of the schedules of the important people in your life. Be conscious of what they have on that day, where they things that are important in their week that they are going to be doing and check up on them. How is that going? There's nothing worse than saying, oh, what do you got on today? And they go, don't you remember? I've told you five times I got this on today. 
And what the fact that you don't remember makes me feel like I don't really matter in your world. So become mindful of schedules. Put stuff on a calendar of what different people, important people in your life are doing. And then the next thing is we need fun. We need play together. That builds connection. Laughing. Just not constant deep talks, but just connecting over fun. Games is very important. And so that's doing things that they enjoy. And then to connect, we need encouragement. We need positive affirmation, validation. Criticism, that that breaks connection. But we need to encourage. Oh, you're good at that. Thank you for doing that. That helps build connection. And then repair, repair, repair. Relationships need a lot of work. We hurt each other. We misunderstand each other. We damage the relationship. And so we constantly have to find ways to repair the damage that is done so there's nothing between us, nothing that has severed the connection that we have felt. So bottom line is relationships maintaining connection takes a lot of work. And that's why you can't have that deeper connection with a whole lot of people because you just don't have the time or the energy. It, it can only happen with a small number of people in order to do that. So I hope that helps you. I want to end by just talking about practical ways of connecting with self because that's where we have to start the healing in reparenting ourselves. We have to connect with the wounded part of us and help it heal. So you have to, number one, have an attitude toward yourself of self-compassion. Being hard on yourself, beating yourself up, down on yourself, punishing yourself, that hinders connecting to yourself. Self-compassion becomes the cornerstone of that. Then become mindful of yourself. So stop in your day, and many do this via journaling, and go, how am I doing intellectually? Am I worrying? Am I obsessing? Am I believing old lies? What tapes are playing in my head? How am I doing emotionally? What emotions are happening? Okay, why am I feeling that emotion? What's the hurt under that emotion? And so you begin to become mindful, more self-aware, more understanding of who you are. And then become aware of when you tend to disconnect from yourself. What kind of events, what kind of things in your life result in you starting to disconnect from your emotions? Most people need a daily routine that helps them connect. They just don't do it very well spontaneously. They got to schedule time to connect with themselves. So time in the morning, time in the evening, and that might include grounding exercises, breathing, centering yourself. That might include going for a walk, meditating, praying, journaling, but just doing a daily routine that helps you connect with yourself and become aware of how you're doing. Some have found it even helpful to have a date night with just themselves where you go out and you do something that you enjoy and you take little wounded you with you and you explore things together that you enjoy. Others have found it very helpful to do inner child work and we've talked about that in the past and there's lots of information on doing inner child which helps heal the wounded little you and integrate them into your life today. Many people like to put the 12 needs on their fridge and then daily look at those needs and go, how am I doing and meeting each of those needs? Oh, I'm not meeting that need very well. Okay, what do I need to do today 
to meet that need so that you are becoming more conscious of meeting your own needs in a healthy way. And then just explore trying new things, getting to know yourself better, having fun, keep learning, keep reading books, See a counselor once in a while so you can just explore things with somebody else. So develop attachment to yourself. This is so central to reparenting yourself. But more than that, we have said in the past that disconnecting from yourself, not building healthy attachment to yourself, is one of the main things that results in people relapsing to drugs and alcohol or to addictive behaviors. So this, I hope, is helpful to you. And I hope you're able to implement it in your own life and see the benefits of learning how to attach with yourself and with others in practical ways. Okay, that's the end of part one. We're going to Move to the second part after a short break, which is the Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, you're free to go. Thanks for being here for the first part. We'll see you next week. Everybody else will be back in just about a minute. Well, welcome back for the Christian part. We've been looking at the life of Abraham, and we're moving ahead a few years now. There's a bit of a break in the story where we're not told a lot, and Abraham is in his late 90s now, and he's struggling a little bit again. And what we've seen is the writer, basically their focus has been on the main problems that Abraham has faced in his journey. And what we have seen is that some of the main problems are internal. Doubts, fears, second-guessing himself, losing some faith. And so what the writer does, every time Abraham is struggling internally, it's just fascinating. The focus becomes how God responds to those struggles. And what we find is that God, every time Abraham struggles and faces major problems, God responds by giving Abraham a promise, a covenant, something that helps him remember the promise and the covenant. And he does different things. He comes at it from different directions. And so today we're going to see God coming to remind Abraham in a time of struggle with two new ways of reminding him of the covenant. So the point I want us to get from this is is this. Abraham is like us. Abraham, many years earlier, had come to see God's promise, and it was central in his thinking. It controlled all of his thinking, his life, it was to him it was a truth that was just overwhelming that he thought he would never lose but what we have found is that as circumstances have happened in his life he started to lose that truth he started to forget it or doubt it and that happens with us we will come to see something and, and it's so clear to us and so profound and powerful to us We think, I'll never forget this. This is life-changing. And six months later, we've forgotten all about it. And we're back to old behaviors, back to old thinking. It's like we never learned that truth in the first place. And so there's a tendency in humans to forget. To forget important truths. Or for those truths to lose their power. And I want to look at why that is so. But I also want us to see, like Abraham, we need reminders 
of important truths because of our tendency to forget. So let me just read the, the account. When Abraham was 99 years old, so he's an old guy, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Lord, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down. And God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. And he's repeating the covenant. He's repeated several times already. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. I'm going to give you a new name. Your name will be Abraham. For I am making you the father of many nations. So Abraham was exalted father, Abraham father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come of you. Then God, so the first thing God does is give him a new name. Okay, that's a new way of driving the truth home to Abraham Then the second thing, then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you will be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. So before I get to kind of those two things that God did, a new name and circumcision, two things God did to remind Abraham again when he's struggling about whether or not he's going to have any children, why is it that we forget? So the first reason is life is busy. Life is many responsibilities. And so, as things begin to get busier and more responsibilities come, they tend to start crowding out things. Our brain can only work on so many things at a time. And so it crowds out some stuff that it's not working on right now. So you can picture a juggler who's got two balls, then three balls, then four balls, and five balls. And, and, And the more he juggles the busier his hand get until all of a sudden he can't handle the sixth ball or seventh ball. He doesn't have the capacity. So something has to fall. And that happens in life. We get so busy, we get overwhelmed that our brain can't keep up in it. It goes back to old programming. But I think for people from complex trauma... We forget because we disconnect. We, when we're connected, learn a truth. It changes us. But our tendency is dissociation. Our tendency is to disconnect. And so as we disconnect from our emotions, we also disconnect from our thinking. And we go back to subconscious. And so that truth that we had when we were so connected to ourselves is gone because we're disconnected again. And so whenever we disconnect from ourselves, we start to forget the important truths about life. And that is a complex trauma consequence. Then I think there's the law of entropy. And basically the law of entropy says this. If you aren't working to maintain a house, keep it clean, dust it, wash the floors, vacuum, it will gradually go into this more and more chaotic, disorganized, messy state. That's just life. Things break down. In order for things to stay healthy and clean, they take constant work, constant maintenance. So a relationship that doesn't have constant work begins to drift apart because it needs constant work to maintain connection. If I'm not working on myself 
spiritually, I gradually drift spiritually and grow cold spiritually. A bonfire that's not fed wood eventually goes out. That's the law of, law of nature. And so what happens if I'm not maintaining my connection to myself, my connection to God, my connection to my others, I will start to break down, and that means I'll start to forget. I'll start to go back to a disorganized state of chaos from the old programming of life. And so we have to constantly be aware of those things, but because of those things just happen naturally, we need reminders. We need to expose ourselves regularly to be reminded of key truths that make life work. And so you need to be able to build into your life ways that help you keep remembering the core truths about life. But I want to just have you think about what God did with Abraham here. So he repeated the truths, yes. But he did two things to help Abraham remember those truths. He gave him a new name and he circumcised him. Or I'm going to say he left a mark on his body. And you might equate that to a tattoo. Do you want to know what I've seen some people do in recovery to help them remember the key truths of their life? Some of them have chosen an animal name, a spirit name, a, a, a new name for themselves. That's their recovery name. That's the name that reminds them of truth. And some people have gotten a tattoo, a tattoo that puts on their flesh a reminder of a key truth. That's in keeping with what God did to Abraham. So now some of you can go out and say, I just got permission to get another tattoo. But make it a tattoo that reminds you of a key truth that you are likely to forget when life gets busy, when recovery gets hard. And so what God does with Abraham, this is what I want you to see, is he understands his weakness. He understands the weakness of humans to forget key things. And so God graciously reminds us of truth, but he also gives us extra little things to help us remember, and it's okay for us to give ourselves those things to help us remember. Let's pray. Father, I just, again, I'm so thankful that you condescend to our weakness. You meet us in our weakness, in our vulnerabilities. You meet us where we're at, and you work with us there. You don't condemn us there or shame us there. You remind us. You give us things to help us remember, practical things. Thank you for your goodness, and just encourage people from this tonight, I pray. Amen. Well, that's the end of our evening. Thank you again so much for being part of it.